if you got here a little bit late and uh, didn't catch our Sabbath school lesson, come a little early next time. Get up a little earlier and join us. Um, they're meeting a little bit earlier, have longer class time, and we're including a couple songs in the process. And if you, like me, are warm this morning, hot, take off your jacket, um, sweater if you're warm, be comfortable, and let's enjoy a time of worship together this morning. Also, when you came in, <clears throat> you should have been um, given an opportunity to get the Bible reading plan. If you have your own, that's fine. But I want to encourage each of you this year to read through the Bible. And we've made um, paperback outreach Bibles in the Christian Standard Bible format available for those who would like to read the same version I'm reading through. And I uh, will use those also in the sermon times. This is a reading edition, not a study Bible, but it helps us to read something together in a similar pace. And in about two weeks, I'll have the next edition. There's one of these comes out every quarter for the reading plan. <clears throat> the idea is to read chronologically each section, Old Testament or New Testament. And then we'll go back and forth between Old Testament and New Testament periodically so that you haven't forgotten what you read in the Old Testament when you go to the New and hopefully you can make better connections, especially in Matthew. Matthew uses a lot of references to the Old Testament. Revelation does the same thing. So we're trying to put those two closer in your reading time, in your mind, in proximity, so you can make those connections um, with Bible prophecy. So anyway, uh, if you need one, see me after the service. We've got to get that to you. You also should have a sermon handout. And if you look on one side, of that handout, it will say seven habits for Bible study. That's going to be our sermon notes. The other side says eight examples of uh, King James words that might be out of date for uh, the readers today. I know that I was caught off guard by several of these. There's 73 such words that um, one particular person has uh, named. And so it's always good to read the Bible with an English dictionary at hand. But for those of you who are King James readers normally, I'm hoping you get an ace on this. Take it as a quiz. And in those spaces where there's parentheses, put the word or words that you think best, um, best describes the word that is in the King James. Example for number one. God is my record. What is another English word that we use today that would mean that? Put that in there. Uh, if you are a reader of King James, you probably know what that means. Put an equivalent word in there. You can use your CSV um, outreach Bible to look up the page number. I think there's a page number there beneath the filament 1-8, and you can look those up and put in the English word that they use, or you can use whatever other Bible to put the English word that is used there. Um, and we're going to go over that in the sermon to see how you did. A little quiz for fun this morning. All right. With that, let me uh, have a word of prayer to open our service. And then we're going to be, I'm going to be calling forth um, a couple, Fred and Cher, many of you might know, uh, to come and bring their new baby. And um, we're going to dedicate her this morning. And I'm going to ask you to participate. I usually... Um, Ask not only a couple to make a commitment to raise their children, the child that they're presenting in the name of the Lord, but also the church to try to catch them doing good uh, and point that out and affirm them, as opposed to the old way of uh, never saying anything when they do good, but when they say bad, you always point it out and call them on the carpet. Let's try to turn that around. I think that's what Jesus did in coming to be our Savior. He didn't change the law, but he framed it in a whole new way. And so hopefully we can do that as well. So with that, let us bow our heads for prayer. Father God, thank you for this year's Sabbath day. Happy Sabbath to you this morning. Thank you for the privilege of being here. Thank you for this safe and quiet building, worship center, where we can gather this morning. I pray we'll continue throughout this day to lift up our brothers and sisters in Christ in Ukraine. I pray that we will also lift up our leaders around the world and help us through these troubling times 
while we know that they are signs of your soon return, help us not miss an opportunity to represent you well, to love others in your name in these testing times, in these signs of your soon return. May we be found faithful. Father God, bless us today as we have come to meet together through prayer, through song, through encouragement, through tears, through hopes, through the sermon, that all things may be done, may be done to your glory and to your honor, including the dedication of this darling daughter this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Fred and Cher, if you would come on down with, uh, um, with your three children. If the two boys would like to join you, and of course, little Phaedra. This is Caden. He's five, and Carson three. Excellent. Bless her. All right. Phaedra is sleeping. So, um, so I wanted to give you a little bit of an intro about the family. Besides finding that special person to marry, being able to have healthy children and raise them up to know the Lord and love the Lord is at least the second most important thing in our lives, right? And um, so they found each other. They had two handsome young boys here. Were you eager for a daughter to come along too? Uh, I mean, a, a sister. <laughs> they were your answer to daughter. You're too early for a daughter, but yes. Uh, for a sister. Um, we were made to love each other, to procreate, and to raise up our children to know and love and serve the Lord. And that's what they're here today to uh, proclaim before you and to ask your assistance as they choose to raise their children to know and love the Lord. I'm off camera, so let me make sure that you are on. Scoot over the over this a little bit. Thank you. So Fred and Cher uh, have been twice blessed, as you have seen, with their two uh, boys, Caden and Karsten. Uh, and they began to hope and pray for another child. This time, I think we got two boys. How about a girl? Maybe mom might want to go. Maybe dad. Seems like dad one, you know, wants a daughter. So baby number three was being prayed for. She had already carried and delivered two healthy boys and prayed and had faith that God would bless her in bringing a girl to their household. And sure enough, that's what happened. When God blessed Fred and Cher with a beautiful baby girl, they named her uh, proudly after daddy. Phaedra, am I pronouncing it right? Phaedra. And they also chose a middle name for her, Lillian. Is that what I'm pronouncing that right? Lillian is your mom? Uh, grandmother. Grandmother, excuse me, her grandmother. So, 
late grandmother. Okay, in honor of her late grandmother, Lillian. So today, Phaedra Lillian Bill is being presented here. She was born on December 22nd, 2021. At that time, she was born six pounds. Today, she's a healthy 12 pound young little girl. And um, Cher says that Phaedra enjoys cooing and smiling when she's awake. So you have to wait for her to wake up. Uh, and today, her family is here to present her to the Lord. And uh, if she will let me, if I could take her in my arms, I'm going to uh, hold her and a little bit different than I have done in the past. I'm just going to lay my hand on her. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, look at this beautiful daughter you have made. Thank you for giving Phaedra to Fred and Cher and the boys. Thank you for giving her to our church family. As I lay my hand of anointing upon her, pray a blessing upon her, that she may grow to know you, to love you, and to be one of your Bible greats. Maybe she won't be written in history, but Lord, if she's written in the hearts of her parents and in your heart, makes an impact for the world in your name, whether it be a simple place that she makes her mark or perhaps renown, we know not. But like little Esther and many other heroes of the Bible who were women, we pray a blessing upon Phaedra that today she would be your anointed and that we would help her to grow, to know about you, to love you, to serve you. As she grows to be a young woman many years from now, may her childhood be filled with faith and love and family and hope. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Dios te bendiga. And blessings to you. Um, before you go down, one more thing. Now we got to ask them to make their commitment. How many of you will say today, I'm going to be looking to catch her to do good and acknowledge you can count on me to be on your side? We need that, right? All right. God bless. Thank you for participating this morning. Thank you. I'd like to say good morning and happy Sabbath to everyone. Good morning and happy Sabbath. <laughs> we have some songs that we've selected that we um, that we can appreciate and we hope that you will enjoy them as well. Um, our first song is You're My Hiding Place. And when I think about God being our hiding place, that says to me that regardless of what's going on in our lives, um, the turmoil, uh, regardless of whether we see the end, Mm -hmm. um, from where we are, that God is our hiding place, he is our refuge and our strength, very yeah. present help in trouble. May you be blessed by this song. Mm -hmm.
do something a little special. We're going to have two groups. There's going to be a group A, who's uh, Tanya will lead that group, and I will represent group B. And so just kind of follow me, and we'll uh, sing together. Uh, Tanya will lead us in group A, and group I will be group A B. will be this side, and group B will be the other side. So yes. group A will follow me, group B will follow Toria. I think I'm being instructed to stand on the other side. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I don't see to. I it's the math. Okay. All right. I'll stand over here for you.
that song is found in your hymnal on page 524. And truly, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him and his word. Robert Wilson. I am here to offer prayer to the Lord on behalf of every individual inside this congregation. Amen. And plus those who are on stream, those who are wherever you may be. Amen. They come from the east, they mm. come from the west, they come from the north, they come from the south. Mm. They are all gathered together with Jesus as guests. Mm. Right. And we are looking forward one day, Jesus will be our guest. I'm not here to preach a little sermon, but I want to keep in your head, in your mind, that the one we are here worshiping this morning, he is looking down over us, and he has already made provision for you and I. Yeah. Those who are able to kneel, will kneel and ask to stand up. I don't like praying standing up, but I, due to circumstances beyond our control, I stand up, but I'm inviting you in the bow or whatever position to pray today. 
Let us pray. O kind and loving Father, it is such a wonderful privilege when we could come together as your children to give you thanks mm. for the past week, for the past month, for the past few years that we, we have been living in until this very moment and the very last breath that we have taken right now. Mm. You are with us. At this moment, Lord, whatever we may have failed to ask of you, I'm praying that you grant unto us according to your divine will. Amen. Every individual beyond the sound of my voice, dear Lord, we, every one of us have a different opinion, a different mind, but there's one thing that we have in common. We are here to worship you, Lord. And I am so thankful for the Holy Spirit that is amongst us as we worship you. I thank you for the holy angels that over around those pews as we worship you. They are not visible, Lord, but we, we, we want to live this life that is in accordance with you, that when we worship you in heaven, we will realize that the angels are right around us. With this in mind, I want to give you the honor, mm. the praise, and the glory. Yeah. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. Yeah. And Lord, as we come to the close of this prayer, I want to present every individual because the, every one of us come here for a special blessing. Mm. Jacob, in wrestling with the Lord, he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. Mm. Yeah. And so, Lord, I pray, don't let us leave this place without you bless us. Amen. I want to present the, the pastor before you, dear Lord, a man that you have chosen to send in Lakeland Seventh-day Adventist Church. You know better. So those of us who may not be all together, let us remember, you told us in Matthew chapter 13, let both grow together until the harvest. Mm. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tears and bound them in bundles to the bar. For the wheat gather into my box. Yes, sir. And so, Lord, we want to leave this situation in your hands, in your care, and in your keeping. Let him speak the words that you have chosen to let him speak. Yes, sir. Touch his lips mm. with fire from above. Yes. Mm -hmm. Give every one of us receptive hearts. <clears throat> Whatever, dear Lord, that we don't agree with, let us study again. Yeah. Study to show thyself approved unto God, for a workman needeth not to be ashamed, mm. rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. You make provision for us, dear Lord, and let us seek for it. As we close our prayer this morning, I went to, there are many people I didn't ask for a special prayer, but Lord, you know every individual's heart. Yeah. So I pray that you will grant unto them according to your will. Mm. Yeah. And as we close this prayer, dear Lord, we would like to pray in the form that you have teach us to pray as all of us repeat the Lord's prayer together. Our, Our Father, Father which are in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, will thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Elder Robert. If anyone did not get a sermon handout, if you could raise your hand right now, I think Fred is ready to make sure you get one. And um, 
We are in part four. If you're visiting us for the first time today, this is the last part in this series. Um, next week, we are going to have the pulpit filled with Elder Aaron O, who has um, a message for us from the Lord, followed by um, Elder Kit um, over there, who's going to have a message for us the following week, and then I'll be back in the pulpit again with a new sermon, a new series. Um, but I want to uh, encourage you, if you haven't had the first two or three in this series, do so because they build on each other. Today is a wrap-up of our seven uh, habits or action steps to have a good plan of uh, studying the Bible, getting to know God in a deeper way than just casual reading, which is what we're using the CSB for this year, just casual reading to get the Word of God in. But when you study it, we have some... Uh, practices that we can use that I've learned in seminary, that I've learned in our churches, that I have developed over the years. And I hope that for anybody who doesn't have a good plan, it will help you. Maybe you'll add to the plan you already have, especially our young people um, uh, and, and people who don't have a plan, that this would help you develop a consistent uh, Bible reading and study plan. So as we begin today, um, it's good to know um, and I think I was going to pray first, uh, again, if you don't mind me doing so, to back up uh, what Elder Robert just said, Lord, I do pray. I'm in full agreement. May it be your words that come forth. May it be your heart, uh, your being that is exposed today as we look at your word. May we uh, gather tools to better help us to handle your word. Um, with integrity, and to share it with effectiveness with others. Uh, we pray this, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name and to your honor and glory. Amen. <clears throat> we don't know how to read and study the Bible. Uh, we will continue to end up in different locations, different destinations, uh, with different opinions, um, more so than normal, just because we have different views and different perspectives. But a consistent Bible plan will help us to find more common ground, and it will make us more effective in sharing our faith with our neighbors, with other people around us. And so I hope these, uh, this uh, sermon will wrap things up and help you to be more effective witness, as well as a Bible reader and student. In 1611, and I have, if anybody would like to see this after the service, I have a copy of the 1611 King James Version. And I can guarantee you, you will not find it an easy read. Um, it is uh, quite difficult, and some of the letters are different. The V was what we call a V, was their U. Um, and so um, it's just difficult sometimes even to pronounce the words, um, even though you might uh, recognize what they are actually uh, saying. Um, it's sometimes difficult to read it. So um, this is a, what it looks like. If you'd like to come see it afterwards, you're welcome to. But right after the 1611 version uh, was done, um, it began just like today. It became uh, that people became aware that updates needed to be made, improvements needed to be made, because the goal of translation um, is not just getting it right from the Hebrew and Greek, which is very important, but it's getting it in a way that we understood right from the people who read it. Um, and so there's a, a balancing act there to translate into the modern vernacular. And over the time that has transpired, the King James has been updated numerous times. But there came some point in time when little update was done, especially the, the thing that some of us really like about the King James, that higher, you know, thou and, and uh, so on and so forth that is used which wasn't any longer a part of common speech, but it stuck and stayed until so much time had passed and so much change had happened in our language that the King James no longer sounded like everybody else sounded who you know, said, how are thee today? We would say, how are you today? And so all those words that became familiar to us as King James were no longer part of the daily language as they once were. And so the translators of the new King James which is my study Bible, um, and it is a study Bible version, and it's the one that I have preached from, uh, almost uh, not this Bible, but this version from the early days of uh, being called to be a pastor. 
um, has taken and put the modern uh, English speech and words uh, in place of the ones that are less normal, less regular, you know, more formal, if you will. And so it has uh, been helpful for students who have lost touch with the King James. So I thought I would do a, a little fun quiz today. Um, I was not aware of so many words that were different. I went online and found a resource. I just picked out eight of them. If you would turn your page that has those eight examples, um, fill them in one eight reads in the King James, God is my record, how greatly I long after you, uh, how greatly I long after, he's writing to the church, uh, um, he's writing to Philemon, and uh, this is kind of his way to say I miss you, but he says, I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. Now that sounds very odd to us today, but in Bible times, it was actually the bowels, it was the stomach, it was the inner center part of the being that was the equivalent of what we would say is our heart. I love you with all my heart is what we say in the United States. They would say, I love you with all my bowels. It doesn't have the same meaning to us, but it meant to them what I love you with all my heart means to us. So the, um, the King James, evidently in that time, it still meant that to them. But for us today, it can be a, a challenge. So it's good to have one of my recommendations at the bottom of the other side of your sheet is to have a dictionary with you when you read your Bible. That will help us to unpackage words like record, which actually means witness. God is my witness. You'll find that in the CSV and in the New King James Version that I said has updated the Old King James. The word bowels means compassion, feelings. I would translate it. Um, I long after you um, in the love of Jesus Christ. That, to me, would make clearer sense today. So let's move on. I don't want to take too much time on these. Number uh, two is Luke 18.1. Men ought to always pray and not to faint. Now, literally, when I read that, uh, it would, it, without, without understanding the context, and King James people automatically, this is not even a problem, um, but for somebody who's not read the Bible, and there's a lot of people out there, they would think fainting is falling over and fainting, becoming unconscious. But what it actually means is not to lose heart or not to give up. The uh, CSB puts it as don't give up. Um, and the New King James says, do not lose heart. Acts 28.8, the father of uh, Publius lay sick of fever and a bloody flux. That sounds a little gross. I don't know what that is, but, and this is one that I didn't know. The other ones I, I, I didn't have really problems with, even though they were odd sayings. I had never uh, recognized this Ed, when I read the text before, uh, and I looked it up, and it means dysentery, which is actually what the CSB and the New King James both put. How many have gotten all these right so far? Anybody? Okay, so we, we there, there's, some room here to realize that even our English, sometimes we need to look up and use the dictionary. And I've had to do that, not, not even just in the King James, but there are some other words that I've run across in reading scripture that I've had to look up in the English Bible just to understand uh, what that means in the context that's being written. Second Timothy 3, 1 through 5 says, in the last days, perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, Many things it goes on to say, without natural affection, incontinent. And for those in the medical profession or who know that word, it doesn't sound like what it actually means. Um, it has nothing to do with the ability to control your bladder, but that's what that word means to us today. It means unrestrained, intemperate. The New King James Version says without self-control. And also something that we sometimes uh, may miss that some of the newer translations do. And again, because they do this and makes it easier for us to read, they're also, uh, in, in making this change, they're doing some interpretation. If they're wrong, they're communicating that wrongness to us. But in this case, I think that the um, CSB is correct. And I think the new Revised Standard Version does the same thing. Instead of translating men, which was the word used, 
the literal word used, the context says this is not just men will be lovers of themselves. This is implying women, humanity. So the men is translated in newer translations as people shall be lovers of themselves in the last days. And that is actually a correct translation for the meaning that was intended uh, by the biblical author. Acts 21, 39. I am a citizen of no mean city. Uh, that phrase would sound like I'm a citizen of a city that isn't mean, isn't angry, isn't, you know, ferocious, isn't mean. Mean is some, something not good, but that's not what it means. What it means in the King James is, I am a citizen of no common city. Uh, I'm a, a citizen of an uncommon city, of a significant city. That's what uh, was meant at that time. The newer translations uh, tend to do that. Although the King James, New King James doesn't upgrade that word. It uses the same as the King James and uses the word mean. Now, Luke 24, 41. Have ye here any meat? Is the question. And uh, for those of us who, if we're doing a Bible study about vegetarianism or about you know God's diet uh, being the preferred diet from Eden, some people might pull this text up and say, "Look, here's these Christians saying, hey, 'Hey, I'm hungry. You got any meat?'" But that word in King James, even King James people know this one, I'm sure, um, but not everybody will. You might share this, and they say, "Look, here's a follower of Christ asking for meat." They're not actually asking for meat. What they're asking for is food. And the word meat was used for meaning any kind of food. It could be vegetables, fish. Of course, meat is included. Now, we still have this usage in, in some forms today. We don't use it in this just like this. But if you said, I cracked open a nut and I picked out its meat, that's not meat. That's a nut. But we call it the meat of the nut. So we still have some of that in our language today where meat meant food, the nourishment that was in it. But that may not be obvious to people today, so you need to be able to translate that for them and help them understand. Matthew 3, 8. Bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. Now, here's another one. This meat is M-E-E-T, not M-E-A-T like the previous one. But what does that mean? Bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. Well, again, the New King James uh, translates it, worthy of repentance. That's a good translation. Um, appropriate for repentance, suitable for repentance, fitting of repentance. Those would all be good translations and more clear than using the word meat, which isn't used in our English language that way today. The final one is Acts 2.40. Now there's 73 of these examples uh, in the King James, but these are just eight examples. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. I uh, would assume from the context, it must mean something about uh, this bad generation, this evil generation, but I really didn't know that untoward does mean perverse, corrupt, crooked. That's the literal um, definition of that word. And the CSB uses corrupt and the New King James version uses perverse. So um, just to be aware that if we want to be uh, helpful to people to be able to read and understand scripture, sometimes we have to do translation for them of the English. King James or others, sometimes we need to do that, but we need to be aware that the King James is not always an easy to understand um, text for people these days, even though it's popular, not just in the Adventist church, throughout the Bible Belt, in the South and Central part of the United States, that King James and some churches, it's like that's the only book. The other ones are all somehow um, unsafe and, um, and not trustworthy. But I believe that God is a bigger God than that, and that he has protected his word, his message, and his truth, and that we can support our Adventist understanding of that truth in any translation that one would bring. And if you want to challenge me on that, bring a translation to me, and I will sit down and show you the Adventist message in that translation. We can do that together. All right. With that, let's move on now. I want to share with you today how to go deeper than just a casual reading, um, not only for yourself, but so that you can share it more effectively with others. Just because we might love and uh, use the, new King, the King James Version 
uh, or the New King James in my case, uh, doesn't mean that um, those versions will be easily understood by others. And these are some things that can help us to help others to understand God's word. I'm going to quickly review the first three we dealt with last week. For those who weren't here, they're on your notes. Read a translation you can easily understand. The reason for that is simply you'll spend more time in your study trying to understand it than you could have spent um, if you understood the English trying to interpret it and apply it to today's life. So try to get something that you can understand easily. Romans 10, 9 through 17, and you have the page there in the CSV, and 1 Corinthians 14, 1 through 11 are two um, texts that um, I've chosen to represent that. Now, in addition, let me add this. Um, not only an easy to understand translation, but there, um, I mean, let's be honest, not everybody's interested in the Bible. Uh, a lot less people are interested in the Bible these days than when some of you here were growing up. Um, the United States has become less and less and less interested in religion, Christianity, and the Bible. Now, uh, some have become more um, deeply uh, ingrained in their faith, but a lot of people have become secular. So some things that you can do if you want to share the Bible, get somebody reading the Bible, is challenge them to read it with you and pick something that maybe has a focus that you'd be interested in. This is one I got a number of years ago. It's the New International Version, Jesus uh, edition. In other words, it looks for Jesus from Genesis to Revelation. Now, if that piques somebody's interest, that focus with all kinds of helps looking for Jesus pictures and so on, if that gets somebody interested to read the Bible, use that to get them reading the Bible. Another one is the, uh, it's called the Narrated Bible. This is also a New International Version. They they, they just happen to be the version of translators that you use this method of putting focuses on different NIV um, translations to interest people to read the Bible. This one is the chronological order. It is, starts with Genesis, um, but it goes in order of how it is written. So in the Gospels, you'll have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John overlapping each other, and they'll tell you where they go. But this one tries to tell you in chronological order, historically, um, the order the books actually happen, not necessarily written, but they actually occurred in history. For those who like to do Bible studies, small groups, this is one that I love to use in small groups. You don't have to come up with Bible studies. You can just use this Bible as a study. It's called the Serendipity Bible. Again, NIV put it together a number of years ago. In the side, it has uh, questions to ask the group to get to know each other, kind of break the ice. Then it has questions to dig. What does the Bible say? What is happening here? Who is it going to? What is the problem being addressed? And then how do we apply this to our lives? That's in the column for every single book. And finally, and this is not the last one, uh, I don't have a copy of the Andrew Study Bible, but for those of you who love Ellen White quotes, uh, the Andrew Study Bible has Ellen White quotes alongside the passages for each of the portions of Scripture. And some people have said to me who have that, but they really love it. Finally, this one is, again, a New International Version. Um, the only one that I know that offers this, but you can go out and look and see. This is called the Archaeological Study Bible. And there's all kinds of information about things that archaeologists have found in digs and insights from history. Um, that you can find in this Bible. If these kinds of things will interest your children, your neighbors, your family in reading the Bible, and I said to you, I think last week, some are even written in cartoon format. The characters are not written to look like you and me. They're written to look like cartoon characters, and there's little bubbles for their speaking. If that interests you, and I think it's called the Adventure Bible. Is that the Adventure Bible? Uh, you may disagree with me. But I believe, standing before the Lord God, that if it will get per, a person into the Bible reading it, what might be negative to you or me is minor compared to the Word of God through that format that people will read in. And they will mature and grow, and you can introduce them to your study Bible later on. But get them started in the Bible. This year, my appeal to you is read the Bible. Read it through in whatever way, whatever uh, translation that you can understand. Number two, know whether 
the Bible favors a word for word or a font for font format. Um, every Bible in the front, same with this uh, CSB, will tell you what their translation philosophy is. Um, the King James tends to be more word for word. The New King James uh, still tries to go word for word and kind of balance towards the middle uh, between word for word and thought for thought. Um, some translations are heavily thought for thought. The reason you need to know that, in my opinion, is if you like reading a thought for thought translation, because it's so easy and sounds so familiar, you need to also compare it to a word for word type translation. It will challenge you. If you're used to reading a word for word translation, you really need to read a thought for thought translation. It will challenge you. You will get a different perspective on God's word just by reading a different translation philosophy. Acts 8, 26 is a great example of this through 31. The Ethiopian eunuch is riding along. He's reading from the Old Testament. He doesn't understand what he's reading. I, I believe that he understood the language. He just didn't understand what it meant. And so God uh, sends his servant alongside. Philip comes running up to the chariot, and he is invited to sit in the chariot with the uh, Ethiopian eunuch, and he begins to explain to him. That means thought for thought. He's not arguing over the words here. He's explaining what those words mean, and that's what thought for thought is all about. And so he does so for the eunuch, and the eunuch actually decides when he sees a, a body of water that he wants to be baptized and commit his life to Christ from that thought for thought Bible study. Number three, look for the battle between good and evil, between God and Satan. It's throughout all the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, every book, that battle is there. It's in our lives today as well. As we begin to look for it, we might actually see God's activity from a different perspective. I have, without looking for that battle, you might see God as an angry God, a mean God, like some people perceive him in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, he's a loving, friendly God, Jesus. But if you look for that battle in every single book, from Genesis to Revelation, you will see that God, if evil is Satan's little game he's playing, that God is seeking always to reach us and draw us to himself. He forgives again and again and again and continues through ways that sometimes we've used in parenting, threats. Have you ever used that in parenting? And blessings, you know, here's what's going to happen if you don't. Here's what I'll do for you if you do. God speaks to them in their own language, and he comes across that way in the Old Testament. But what is he doing? He's seeking to really love humanity in a way that will bring change into their life. Because that change that will come to those who obey God, who trust God, will actually be the blessing. It's not just that God waves his wand and gives a blessing, but he leads us to live a way that will bring a blessing because of the way that we live. And that's why obedience is so important. John 5, 39, uh, John 17, 1 to 3, talk about the focus of scripture, not only being this controversy, but that the culminating um, act of God, his plan of salvation, surrounds the work of Jesus Christ, the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And of course, Revelation 12 puts that in a whole package with Satan being an angel from heaven, fallen, uh, having uh, gone against God, having rallied a third of the angels with him, and he's cast to the earth where he comes into our lives and seeks to ruin our lives and break up our relationship with God. But God sends his Messiah, Christ, and through that Messiah, he draws all that would um, hear his good news and accept his love unto himself, that he may redeem us and save us from not only sin, which is the act we commit against God, but also the penalty of sin, which is damnation, lostness, um, destruction, and death for eternity. All right, today we're going to cover the last, um, what's it, we have seven total, so uh, the last four. Uh, and number four is this, be aware of what type of salvation the inspired writer is referring to. How many of you read the Bible and recognize there are two types of salvation in Scripture? How many of you are aware of that? Raise your hand. Thank you. Praise God. I'm glad that a few of you do. This is where um, Adventists, I think in particular, and we're not alone in this, 
But Adventists uh, get in trouble when they argue with non-Adventists, non-Adventist Christians, and vice versa. Because we don't understand, before we get into an argument, or they get into an argument with us, what they mean when they're talking about salvation, and what we mean, or we don't sometimes understand even what we mean when we're talking about salvation. We do, but we aren't conscious of it. What I mean by that is that we focus a lot because Christ is coming again soon and we are called to basically get our act together and to be his people on the earth. We know that God has called us to save us from sin, from the, not the penalty of sin, but from the action of sin, from participation in a life of sin. He's called us to righteousness. He's called us to holiness like he is holy. That is temporal salvation. It is obedience that has a direct result of salvation because we've obeyed it. We obey the health laws. We'll be saved from diseases that would be caused by not obeying those health laws. That's an example of what I'm talking about. However, a lot of other people, when they talk about salvation, and I have been a part of this group, even as an Adventist early on in my ministry, what, what they have met and what I early on have met was, um, how am I accepted by God? And scripture is very clear on this. We are accepted by God by grace, right? Not a works lest anyone should boast. And so there are a lot who are focused on their acceptance by God, their forgiveness. They're right into heaven. Their, their salvation is uh, by grace, scripture says, through faith. So we argue about, well, is it works? Is it not? And what we're arguing about is, well, which kind of salvation? Are you talking about deliverance from, let's just use the example I already gave, from uh, cancer or from gout or from various uh, diseases? Well, that won't come just because you love God and know he loves you and you trust he's going to take care of you. No, the way he takes care of us, he says, listen, don't eat these things. And you won't get those things, you won't get those uh, diseases. So salvation from disease, temporal salvation, earthly salvation, earthly deliverance is done by obeying. The way the people of God were delivered from Egypt is that they stepped in between the waters and they acted. And so they were temporally on earth delivered because they obeyed. But their eternal salvation in the judgment all have sinned, scripture says, right? Romans 3.23. All have sinned and for, fall short of the glory of God. Uh, in heaven, no one will be accepted by God and receive salvation, eternal life, because of their obedience. Because we've also disobeyed. We are flawed. We are not perfect. None of us. Only Jesus was perfect. So we are saved totally by faith when you're talking about eternal salvation. It's important as we read scripture in every passage to pay attention to this. Let me give you a couple of quick examples. 2 Samuel 22, 1 to 4, page 274 in the CSB. Here's what it says um, from the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible. My Savior, you saved me from violence and from my enemies. The word save is the same word. Same concept of salvation throughout scripture, but it's in a different context. He's talking about God saving him from violence. That's temporal salvation. Saving him from his enemies, temporal salvation. When we pray for God to deliver us in a test, to help us come back with a good results from an x-ray, we're asking for temporal salvation. The Bible example of eternal salvation is 2 Timothy 1 Verse 10, page 1024 in the CSB. And here it says, our Savior, Jesus Christ, has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Here, what is being talked about is eternal salvation. He's our Savior. That's related to salvation. What salvation? He's not talking here about deliverance to the Red Sea. He's not talking about deliverance from enemies. He's not talking about any kind of temporal thing, he's talking about eternity, that we would be raised from the dead and given new life and redeemed for all eternity. Here is an example where 
temporal and eternal salvation is in the same passage, just a few words apart from each other. And so you have to pay attention when it switches, what are we talking about? Hosea 13, verse 4, page 785 in the CSV. I have been the Lord your God ever since the land of Egypt, when God delivered them out of um, bondage to Pharaoh. No savior exists besides me. In the same context, he says this. In other words, God saved his people from Egypt. That's temporal salvation. In the same passage, Hosea 13, 14, just 10 verses later, page 785 still of the Christian Standard Bible, I will redeem them from death. I will redeem them from death. Here he's talking about bringing back those who have died to life again. And redemption talks about paying for that which would keep them dead, that is paying for our sins, exchanging his life for ours. That picture is, again, of eternal salvation. He's not talking about raising us from the dead here on earth until he raises us to be with him in heaven when he comes again in the clouds. So pay attention to that, and we'll have an easier time discussing salvation with other people if we make sure that we're talking about the same kind of salvation. Then we can talk about it uh, in a more productive way. We need to recognize that God is the God of both eternal salvation and temporal salvation for each one of us. And as a matter of fact, that those have to go together. We can't say, well, you know what? I think I'd like your eternal salvation, God, but I'm not interested in that temporal stuff. I'll live my own life, and then I'll just believe in Jesus for eternity. It doesn't, doesn't work that way. Nowhere in Scripture do I see it working that way. Um, the same is true of temporal salvation. Some people uh, want God to bless them in this life and have abundance and so on and so forth. Well, with that comes eternity because it's a package deal. God will save us then in the judgment, and he shows it by saving us in small ways now. As he saves us in small ways now, it builds our faith. As I see God working in my life to deliver me now, it gives me confidence. That on the big day, the judgment day, he's going to save me too. The God who's been my God will be my God, and the one who's delivered me here will deliver me then. So it works together. Number five, be aware of the writing style and purpose to help you use the text correctly. Now, I'm sure I'll get some different opinions on this one. But I want to tell you, I sat in a Revelation, well, I think it was a Revelation seminar, one of our uh, Adventist seminars, uh, prophecy seminars, early on before I became a Seventh-day Adventist. And I remember a text being shared that was, the idea was to defend that the state of the dead is sleep. And they used the text out of Psalms. Now, I'm simply sharing this. If that means to you what it meant to them, the presenters, that's fine. I'm not trying to change your personal view. Here's what I'm sharing with you. If you want to be effective with people out there, especially those who go higher in education level, those who don't have good biblical background, those who you're sharing your faith with who are maybe readers and understand literary styles, and you try to share a poem, which is what, uh, what Psalms and Proverbs of poetic literature, if you try to share that as teaching literal truth about the state of the dead, you will lose them. They'll say, you're trying to use imagery and poetry to talk about a reality. That is not the most productive way. There are plenty enough texts in scripture to talk about the state of the dead that are written in a literal location in scripture, as opposed to a symbolic language writing, which the book of Psalms is. One of the best ones is, um, Lazarus himself. When Lazarus in Jesus' time um, died, Jesus described it as sleep. He's just asleep. I'm going to go and wake him. Now he wakes three days. That's significant because in Jewish times, there was a belief to understand what we now understand through science, a little different than spiritually, but they had to explain how is it that some people appear to die and then they come back to life. 
And so the way they understood that, not using medical terms, but spiritual terminology, is that the breath of God, the spirit, would leave the body, but in some cases it wouldn't go back to heaven right away. It would actually hover around a little while and then return back into the body and the person would be back alive again. So the belief was that after three days, the spirit is not coming back. It had to come back before three days, and that explained how sometimes people would appear to be dead, they'd be in a coma or whatever we call it today, and then they would come out of it and they would say, wow, they came back to life. Well, they actually, this is, you know, this is how they explained it, is the spirit left and returned. So Jesus was three days, three days in the grave, so that nobody would say in their thinking in that time, well, his spirit just came back into him. They wouldn't say that because it had passed the time when a spirit would return. He was dead. And the same thing he has to say about Lazarus. Jesus knows he can raise Lazarus. So to him, he's sleeping. But the disciples thought, well, if he sleeps, he's going to wake up. No, no, Jesus says, he's dead. Oh, he's dead. But then he also waits that three-day period, so they're not going to say, oh, the spirit just came back into him. They know that dead men don't get up again. When they're dead, they're dead. But Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. And the dead man gets up and walks. That is the power of Jesus to raise you and to raise me in the story of Lazarus. Not only did he demonstrate he can do it for others, he did it for himself three days. Somebody asked me about this. Yes, it wasn't three 24-hour days, but that's not the way they reckon time. That's the way we might reckon time. That's the way some people connect with uh, the example of, um, of um, Jonah and, and the great fish. But the reckoning of days in biblical times was that any portion of a day was a day. And we use that a lot of times, too. When we say, I'll see you in a couple of days, we don't click the watch and watch for two 24-hour periods. Any portion of the day is a day. And three, uh, there were three separate portions, three separate days that Jesus Friday and Saturday and Sunday, that was the three days. And Jesus rose, showing that he had the power over death for his life, meaning he was a righteous, perfect sacrifice. And he had showed us he had the power to raise others so that the new believers in his time knew that he who raised himself had demonstrated power to raise others when he came back for us will bring us to life as well. Is that good news? Good news. So we need to pay attention to whether, for instance, do I have this on the next slide? Uh, poetry and prophecy contains lots of symbolism. Uh, this is important to understand. People who try to make uh, prophecy literal get into all kinds of trouble. It's purposely symbolic. And knowing that, poetry is the same way, we can actually benefit from being able then to understand what those symbols meant in that time and how we can understand those in our time. However, there's other parts of scripture, history, moral law, uh, local instruction. These things are written literally. They're intended to be understood literally, not symbolically, not as metaphor, as some people take uh, Genesis to be these days, but rather they were written with the intent that this is how things actually happen. So if we know that's the type of literature that it is, and we read it that way, it'll help us to understand what scripture is saying. It still might challenge us to compare what scripture is saying with scientific knowledge today, but we'll talk more about that as we move towards the fall. I'm planning to do a series, and I hope you'll bring your friends to it, on science and faith and the Bible, and we'll get into some of those discussions at that point. Number six, and we just have six and seven, and that'll be the seven points for today, and I hope you'll use these in your own study and especially your sharing time. This is probably, apart from praying for God to help you understand scripture, praying for him to reveal Jesus to you, this is perhaps uh, the next most valuable and the one that gets unfortunately overlooked too many times as Christians try to study the Bible with each other. Context. When I came into the church, one of the ways, it's very effective, by the way, and it's very quick to share your faith and to prepare somebody for baptism, to lead them to Jesus, is to use proof texting. Proof texting is where you hop around from text to text to text to prove a certain point. 
However, whether you discover this or not, anybody, and a lot of people do, can go to the Bible with their uh, ideas, with their convictions, and look for text to prove their point and give you a study and show you how the Bible proves their point. So it's very dangerous if proof texting is our only method. That might be a method to study after you've contexted. People today do a lot of texting. I want to encourage our young people that while you're texting, remember the context, not just proof text. That is to say, know the bigger picture. When you read a phrase, it sounds like, oh, that would be a good Bible passage. It says just what I want to say. Read before, read after, read the whole chapter, read the whole book, read the whole Bible. Make sure that you've read that in the context that the inspired writer intended it to be understood. Not as you or somebody studying with you wants it to be understood. And a good example of this uh, is the Bible pledge that we uh, have kind of let go. And I encourage young people, let me know if I forget it. Let's reignite that again. If you still remember it, let's say it together. What says the Bible, the blessed Bible? This my only question be, the teachings of men so often mislead us. What says the Bible to me? Amen? And um, one example of this, which you'll find in Acts 10, um, let's take a look at that. We can open this. This will be the one text that we actually open today for the sake of time. Acts 10. And that's page 947 to 949 in the CSB. 947 to 949. It starts on the very bottom of 947, Acts 10. This is a vision that Cornelius has. Um, and maybe I can maybe I can just share it with a few words instead of reading it. Uh, or would you prefer me to read it? How many prefer me to share it with words? Raise your hand. How many prefer I read it? Raise your hand. Okay. I think there's a few more there for sharing it. Read it. It's right there. You have it open now. Um, Cornelius has a vision, uh, an experience with God, by which he is told. Uh, he's a devout man who feared God. He's not a Jew. And let's see. <clears throat> An angel told him, verse 4, at least I'll read a couple of verses here. Your prayers and your acts of charity have ascended as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa and call for Simon, who is also named Peter. He is lodging at Simon the Tanner's house. <clears throat> so God uh, accepts a non-Jew. This is radical to a Jew at that time. It's like in our early church, whether you remember our church history or not, in early Adventism, when we were putting out the call for people to prepare for Christ's return, we believe there was a period of time called the shut door period. How many of you heard that time? Okay. When we believe that all had heard and had opportunity and those that were not Adventists now rejected God and they were going to be lost. There was no turning for them. The door had been closed. And I remember a story being told to me about an experience that happened in a church where Ellen and James White were once sat up. And they had this conviction that they were the saints waiting on Christ's return. Nobody else was going to join the church. Evangelism was not being done anymore because probation had closed. And a person came in. I don't know if they had a foyer or just walked in the sanctuary, but they came into the sanctuary and they didn't know the person. And as they greeted each other and got acquainted, he explained how God had led him there. He was not an Adventist yet. And they realized, wait a minute, if God brought him here, the door is not closed. And this and prayer and study led to the Adventist church sending out missionaries across the seas and a whole new time of evangelism, evangelism erupted. And the same thing is happening here in Bible times in the book of Acts. God calls a man who's not a Jew, and he sends him to a Jew who at this point, perception is he's on the outside, he's unclean, uh, he's not a part of us righteous Jews, and that's just the way it is. So he's prepared this man, he sent him to call for uh, Peter or... Um, 
excuse me, I lost my place here, for Simon or for Peter, Simon Peter. And then he has a vision come to Peter. Uh, Peter is resting, and he has this dream, and a sheet comes down um, out of heaven in his dream to him. And as it gets low enough, he looks into it, and he sees that there are all kinds of creatures in there. Uh, the creatures are not all clean creatures. There's a mixture of what Leviticus calls clean creatures and what Leviticus calls unclean creatures. And he looks in and sees all these kinds of reptiles and animals, ones that are, are okay to eat from God's standpoint, and ones that are, we've been told, they've been told not to eat. And he hears a voice that he recognizes as God. And it says this, verse 13, a voice said to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Peter says, no way, Lord. Oh, you're trying to test me. I know you are. I've never eaten anything unclean. You can't pull that one on me. I'm, I'm not going to do it. Second time, verse 15, the voice said to him, what God has made clean, do not call impure. This happened three times, says scripture, verse 16. And suddenly the object was taken up into heaven. Now, here's where some people who don't respect context and um, want to defend that God has made it appropriate to eat any kind of meat that you want um, and that there are no longer any Levitical concerns about clean and unclean foods. They'll stop right there and they'll say, see, God said, go and eat. What would happen if they read further? We have an I think, no. Hopefully we know to read further on this one. We need to do that with all passages and we'll avoid having so many arguments. That's my opinion, your opinion, you say, I say, your church says, my church says. This is not about having this church. This is about the Bible. Let's read. As you read on, you find that Peter is perplexed, verse 17, about what the vision uh, means that he has seen. When he then hears, almost immediately, uh, downstairs, a knock on the door, and Peter comes looking, uh, and, and Cornelius comes looking for Peter, um, then Peter comes down, and he recognizes, uh, let's see here, Peter shows up, and Cornelius bends down his feet to worship, uh, and Peter says, get up, Peter, verse 26, I myself am also a man. While talking with him, he went in and found a large gathering of people, and Peter said to them, you know, and here's what he lets us know, about the beliefs that Jews had at that time about Gentiles, you know that it's forbidden for a Jewish man to associate with or to visit a foreigner that is a non-Jew. For God has shown me that I must not call, but God has shown me that I must not call any person impure or unclean. So now he's revealing what he has understood this vision to mean. He is saying the vision is, didn't tell him I can eat any kind of meat. The vision of clean and unclean meats was used to tell him that I should not call a foreigner, a non-Jew, a Gentile, unclean. What God has made clean through the cross, through Christ, he or anybody else was not to, um, to reject, but was to accept and appreciate. They go back on and repeat the whole scenario. And uh, in verse, let's see here, finish with verse 42. Peter says, he, God, commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and of the dead. All the prophets testify about him, referring to Jesus now, uh, earlier that talked about him being uh, hung on the tree. Uh, hung on the cross, um, and that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. Not every Jew who believes in him, but every one who believes in him. The original challenge, the commission of Abram before he became Abraham, or as he became Abraham, was that they would go to every foreign place that God would lead them. They would represent God. They would reveal God's character. People would be astonished, would be uh, uh, astounded at how God blessed them, and they would want 
God to be their God, and they would be a witness to God by which all the world would become followers of God. Unfortunately, they, over time, became self-protective. Some of our churches have become self-protective. Here, Peter's being challenged. Don't be so self-protective that you keep out those I am drawing in. So that was the uh, conflict. If we read the context instead of proof text to try to make our point, it will help us to know and communicate the true Bible message of God. Here are some things you might want to ask as you read. Who is the audience that's being addressed in this passage? What is the issue being addressed in this passage? Who does God, how does God deal with the people and the issue being addressed? What lessons can we learn from the complete account as we read the whole context to apply it to our lives today in our own cultural setting? And the last point is let God speak. I don't know if you've ever noticed this problem in your study life. Uh, it's a good thing to bring questions we have to Scripture, to go to Scripture to find answers to the questions that we have. But sometimes we ought to have in our plan of study just going to the Bible and reading it, like I'm trying to challenge you to do this year, without trying to prove anything, without trying to understand our agenda, to just go to the Bible and read it and let God speak. Think about how much we appreciate that. I get in trouble at, at home and sometimes in relationships when I'm always looking at what I'm going to say next. And I get challenged. You haven't heard me. You're not listening. Just stop. Get all of the stuff out of your mind and listen. We need to do that with Bible study. Instead of going, waiting to discover something we want, go empty to be filled. Go open to be taught. Go seeking to learn. If you seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, scripture says, all these things and all understanding will be added to you. So let God speak through his inspired word. Revelation 2, verse 7, page 1056, says, Those who have ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We have ears. We should be able to hear. Everyone should be able to hear God because we have eyes and we have brains and we can read his word in English. We don't have to use Hebrew and Greek. And yet there are so many denominations and differences because we have difficulty letting God speak. And we want to prove what we want to prove. James 4, 7 through 12 also speaks to this topic. And I'll let you look that up later, page 1042. So ultimately, Jesus is the one that I hope we find in Scripture. Some will say, well, that's not an Adventist message. Every Christian church preaches Jesus. And if we ever stop, we will no longer be his remnant. Let me just challenge you really straight up. I don't think that will ever be. But there are individuals who sometimes have problems with that. Seeing Jesus as, well, everybody's got that. Well, that's the only thing that will save you in me is Jesus. Now, in addition to what every church, every Christian needs to be saved, which is Jesus, we are called, um, uh, Matthew 28 says, to make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then what? Teach them all things, right? So there are things to learn once we are saved and secure in Jesus, we need to keep on learning. Those who want to live forever with Jesus are not going to settle with going there ignorant. We're going to want to go to heaven informed. We're going to want to go to heaven trained. We're going to want to go to heaven already having experienced a love relationship with Jesus, living our lives to glorify him here as best we can in preparation for eternity. So as you read and study God's word, as you look in scripture to find the beliefs that we have taken out of Scripture as Seventh-day Adventists and listed as our 28 fundamental beliefs. Please don't miss in all your study for information about God. Don't miss Jesus. 
There's a lot of people that have. If we know everything there's know about God and haven't learned to love him, to not serve him because if we don't, we're going to be lost or burned or damned, or to serve him because we want to be saved, that's all about us. We serve him because he loves us. He's earned our respect, our trust. And our response of obedience is a response of love in kind to the love that he's demonstrated from Genesis to Revelation. Whatever we do, keep looking for God's plan of salvation as you read. Keep looking to find Jesus from Genesis to Revelation. And I pray that no one will leave this place today without the hope of Jesus in their heart, without maybe whispering as I have this final prayer, Jesus, with the capacity I have, I choose you. Jesus, with the ability I have, I choose to put sin aside and seek righteousness. Jesus, I believe that you have saved me on the cross, that you are saving me temporally, see, on the cross eternally, temporally in my life, and that I want to give my life every day into your hands to finish in me what you've begun so that when you come in the clouds, I and you will be like him. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this message. And I pray, Lord, whatever did not land well, let it be washed off with the, like the rains and spring wash off um, everything that it touches and may the seed that was connected with it, that touched hearts today, may that seed be nourished. May it be uh, deeply planted. May it find root and grow up and bear fruit in our lives. And Father God, keep us hungry for your word. Keep us hungry for truth. At the same time, keep us confident in you that you have saved, that you are saving, that you will save, and that you would allow none of us to be lost if we do not remove ourselves from your hands. Father God, thank you for your invitation today to simply come as we are and to be yours and for you to have your way, to do your will in our lives. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. And again, this week, as I think we did last week, there may be some stirred that would like some prayer time right now. If you could, those who are ready to leave, quietly get up, allow those who would like to stay and pray, or maybe whisper with uh, someone they're with about the service to kind of debrief a little bit, let them do that quietly, prayerfully, and bring your conversations um, out into the hallway, and we will see you next week. And God bless you.